we can point to different places around the world where they're really trying to get zero waste. Over 50% of the municipalities in New Zealand have adopted a zero waste strategy. Canberra, Australia has had a zero waste policy since 1996. Nova Scotia, the whole province of Nova Scotia. And then over in San Francisco, dear, dear San Francisco, my goodness, if you can do it in San Francisco, you can do it anywhere. San Francisco, 850,000 people, big high-rise building, little space. People talk three languages, English, um, Spanish, and Chinese. You have to educate people in three different languages. By the year 2000, they'd achieved a 50% diversion from landfills. By 2004, they'd achieved 64% diversion from landfills. Their goal for 2010, which is only four years from now, is 75% diversion. And by 2020, 100% diversion or zero waste. One of the reasons that they are confident in San Francisco that they can do this is that they've got the economic incentives worked out very well. The company that has the collection contract in San Francisco for all the discarded materials owns the recycling and owns the composting, but they don't own the landfill. And so when they give the residuals to the landfill, they are paying their competitors. Obviously, they want to minimize the use of the landfill, which is the interest of the government as well. Uh, and with corporations, we want to say to them, whatever the object, whether it's a car, a television set, a tape recorder, or whatever else, when you make that machine, you have to expect that you're going to get it back and that you will have the task of reusing as many of those parts as again, and if you can't reuse the parts, then to recycle the materials. And we have some very good examples of where that's happening right now. For example, Xerox Corporation in Europe is bringing back the old copying machines from at least 16 different countries into huge warehouses in the Netherlands, stripping down the machines, recovering many of the parts, and where they can't recover the parts, the materials are recycled. They are recovering 95% of the materials in those old copying machines. Now that's pretty exciting, but what's even more exciting is that they are actually saving money. They're saving $76 million a year doing that. Now that's with complicated objects. What about packaging? That's the other thing. Now there's some very good examples of industries that are taking complete responsibility for packaging. They've internalized the packaging costs. The, the most obvious example is the beer industry in Ontario that for over 50 years has been using standardized glassed beer bottles, same size, same shape. In Ontario, the biggest province in Canada, they are recovering 98% of the beer bottles. This is no cost to the community at all. The industry organizes themselves. There's 2,000 jobs created doing all this and it's actually cheaper, cheaper per serving. 11 cents cheaper per serving to use a reusable glass bottle than a disposable. But there are other um, front-end solutions to packaging which are being practiced in other uh, countries and communities. For example in Tasmania there's a small town there that's banned plastic shopping bags. Just ban them. You can get paper ones, you can get cloth ones, but you can't get plastic ones. And then we've got some exciting examples in Italy, where some supermarkets are using um, uh, dispensing um, machinery so that you can refill shampoo bottles and detergent bottles and even water bottles. And I think the message here to industry is a little creativity at the front end will save millions at the back end. So. Use this uh, in designing your products and your, and your packages. E la politica? In Italia il governo ipotizza di favorire con sovvenzioni monetarie il consenso nelle zone in cui costruire impianti, anche per bruciare rifiuti. Sentiamo che cosa ne pensa il professor Connet. Is terrible. I think it probably reflects the low priority and the low amount of thinking, intellectual 
thinking that has gone into the waste issue. I'm sure that this new government, for them, waste management is down here. So it's an irritating little thing that we have to put right. It's, it's litter. We have to tidy up Italy. We have to tidy up Italy and, and a little bit of impatience with those communities who don't like the, the tidying up represented by incinerators. And talk about energy from waste. Yes, energy from waste, which is ridiculous. I mean, you get four times as much energy from reusing and recycling the same materials as you burn in an incinerator. So that's a ridiculous argument and shows the, the little depth that, that has gone into the thinking. Most of our major politicians around the world are working on very short time scales. Uh, the, the number of years before they have to be re-elected. They're not bold enough, they're not courageous enough, and they don't trust the people. And so, although people will try to persuade you, the citizens, that stopping incinerators is blocking progress, no, no, no. Stopping incinerators is in the path of progress. It is going to drive the good solutions. It's going to drive zero waste. It's going to drive creativity in industry when you block their toilet. Don't give them their lazy toilet. Demand leadership from your politicians.